Afternoon, Art Hostage here and we're going to do another episode. Today in the Netherlands, Henk Beslin, okay, who was one of the 2002 art thieves along with Octav Durham, who stole the two Van Goghs from the Van Gogh Museum, which they then sold to Raphael Imperiali, right, the Mafia Camara uh, godfather who was extradited from Dubai a couple of months ago or a few weeks ago right, to serve his eight-year sentence in Italy. Okay, Hank Beslin, last August, goes to the Zan Museum on the back of a scooter, runs in and to try to steal a Monet worth $2 million. And on the way out, right, there's um, families there because it's a Sunday morning and members of the public step in and grab the painting, and the rider of the mo uh, of the scooter right let, uh, pulls a gun out of his uh, waist and shoots off three shots, right, endangering lives. Could have killed kids, families, anything, right? Anyway, um, Hank Beslin drops the Monet, gets on the scooter, and they escape. But it's all caught cool on CCTV. Hank Beslin's wig slips down and there's a full uh, uh, um, high-definition photograph of his face so he knows he's going to be arrested. He goes into hiding for 13 days and then hands himself in. He came up in court two weeks ago and admitted um, the attempted robbery or the attempted theft of the uh, $2 million Monet. But he denied that he was endangering lives. Well, today he's come back up in court in the Netherlands and the judges, the panel, because they don't have a jury in the Netherlands, it's just a panel of judges. The judges have um, found him also guilty of endangering lives. Okay, now the um, defence wanted three years and the prosecution wanted four years. Right, um, I know, I know. Right, well, today the judges have come back and they gave him four years in jail. So now Hank Beslin is serving four years for an armed attempted theft of a $2 million Monet in which far, uh, shots were fired, endangering life. Now, whatever you think about the legal system, right, all that message, right, the message that this sends to art thieves in the Netherlands is, ladies and gentlemen, Please start your engines. And if you're going to go and steal art, you might as well take a gun with you because you ain't going to get too much more time in jail. Unbelievable. Now, let me tell you this. If this had been in the UK and Hank Beslin had, had gone to a museum, a small museum, right, up in Cambridgeshire or in Surrey or somewhere, right, and gone in and run out with a Monet, worth $2 million, okay, and the public gave chase, right, like they did with a Da Vinci back in 03, up in Scotland, and then they let off um, shots from a firearm and made their getaway, but then got caught, right? Hank Beslin in the UK would have got 10 years in jail for possession of the firearm, right, uh, letting off the three shots, Right to endanger uh, with a possibility of endangering life, and he would have got four years right for the attempted theft of the Monet. So Hank Beslin in the UK would today be serving fourteen years in jail. In the US, right, I would imagine it would be something similar. You know, what I mean, fifteen to twenty or something like that, right? And he would he would have to serve a minimum of ten years. Okay, but in the Netherlands, they like to be all laid back, smoking weed and all that sort of stuff, and we're all kind of hippie, hippie, you know, libertarians and all we're all liberal, right? And okay, that's fine, yeah, well, we can try and do this, right? But in some instances, right, you have to offer a deterrent because it just encourages future art crime. Hank Beslin now is serving four years. Now, he's been in jail since last August, right? So that's... Nine months he's already served. Now, you serve half the sentence, right, in the Netherlands, right? So he's got to serve two years and then he's released. Well, he's already done nine months, okay? So he's only got another 15 months to do, right? And then he's released. 
and he might get day release even before that. Okay? So what message does that send? Right, right across Europe. Okay, in the UK, maybe a little bit different because um, you use a firearm in any commission of a crime, right? And you're going to get a minimum of five years, right? And probably 10 years. And another thing that's happened in um, um, the UK press, right? That I know it's right. There's a 20 million pound, right? 30 million dollar um, John Constable painting, right? That's been restored and cleaned. Right, and then put back in in a National Trust house, okay? Right, well, I just want another look at where it's sit situated, right? And it's, it's just un almost unbelievable, right? The security there is ridiculous. You know, talk about an accident waiting to happen, right? Well, it's unbelievable. Um, you know, this um, constable painting, right? It, it, the the um, article came out four days ago, right? Constable painting transformed after extensive cleaning, right? Well, it is. It looks a beautiful picture, right? A painting by the world-renowned landscape artist John Constable has gone on display after it underwent 270 hours of cleaning. The embarkation of George IV from Whitehall, the opening of Waterloo Bridge, 1817, uh, was now back to its full glory, the National Trust said. Okay, right, the large painting, right, um... Uh, it's now on display in the Abbey's Library, right? The work has been rehung at the National Trust Anglesey Abbey, right, in Lode, Cambridgeshire. Cambridgeshire. And if you go and have a look, it's just like a big house. Okay? Right, so that's now hanging right back to where it was, right? Now, look, you can see them, right? They've even got photographs of them hanging it on the wall. Okay, right now. If you go to the photograph, right, of it, where it's in situ, right, it's unbelievable, right? I mean, I've um, I tweeted it out about it, right? It's um, it's it's sitting there, right, um, in a little alcove, right? Big painting it is, right? But the Johnsons, right, they could go in there, right, Danny boy, okay, and then the, and the Johnsons, and we're using that as a euphemism for art crime. Thieves, right? It's not every single Johnson, but it's just, it's a name that you use, the Johnson gang. But that's any criminals who steal art, right? And the little gangs and little thieves, and they notice a little um, breach in security or a little lapse. Well, they could go in there, right, with a, and, and I don't want to say it, right, but they could go in there with box cutters, right, or a Stanley knife, right? Yeah, I was lively with a Stanley knife, but in different circumstances. But they could go in there with a Stanley knife, right, and whip it out of its frame, right, in seconds, Right, standing either side, all right, of this painting, right, on um, on plinths, right, are two bronze and ivory medieval figures, right, but they're worth a million pound, right, and then to the right of it, because this is just a, this is a photograph of inside, right, the house, right, the abbey in Lode, Cambridgeshire, right, to the right, there's a um, a bronze, right, of a ice skater. Now, I haven't seen it, right, um, but I think it's probably by him, Frederick Lord Layton, Fred Layton, right? So that's now, that's probably worth £100,000. To the left, you've got another one, right? It looks like it's by Layton as well, right? Um, and then you've got a, a pair of pictures, right, a medieval pictures, right, that are, uh, looks like Sir Thomas More on one, right, and Sir Thomas Cromwell on the other. Okay, right, they're, not, they, you, they're like um, small pictures, you just pick them up, right? So there, and there's a lovely table, I must admit, a lovely table right below the constable, right? I think it might be a William Kent, right? It's a beautiful table, right? It's got a big, like, devil's head in the front, all carved, right, marble top. But the Johnsons could go in there, right, or the art thieves, right? They could whip the um, constable out of its frame in seconds, grab the two... Medieval bronze and ivory, right? Uh, the two Leightons and then, and then the other three medieval pictures, right? And be out within seconds, minutes. It's ridiculous, right? Honestly, talk about a lapse in security, right? Now, what I think they should do, right? They've got security guards during the day, okay? But it, at night, right? Because it's in an alcove, right? They should have some kind of, like, um, like, like, like gates or little, you know, things where they can close it and they can lock it. Which means if they came in at night, right, they've got to break open the locks, they've got to break, you know, they've got to break open them gates. Remember the old-fashioned lift, you pull it across and it's like see-through. 
right, like a shutter. You could put a shutter there because it's already in an alcove. You could put a shutter there, right? Or you could even put something like some perspex in front of it or something like that. But this is just an accident waiting to happen, right? You know, and I hope the security are looking at these things, right? Because I've also warned, um, warned earlier in the year, right, down there at Petworth House, right, they got four um, Turners, Joseph Turners, right, worth tens of millions, right? And the art thieves have been looking at that for decades, right? And they went down there a few years ago because there was a lapse in security. But thankfully, right, two of the um, four Turners were out on loan, or all four of them were out on loan, so they weren't at Petworth House. But it just, you know, it just highlights, doesn't it? You know, you see... Um, the dangers that that, uh, that all these country houses um, face, right? And when you've got specific things, right, like this constable, and you just got to be careful when you, you know, publicise that. You know, with two clicks of the mouse, right, I've, you know, I've discovered that it's sitting there in an alcove, right, vulnerable. Okay, and if I do this, right, of course the Johnsons do that. Of course all art thieves and handlers and people who send thieves and burglars out to steal, you know, steal art and antiques. I mean, I, did, I used to do it myself 30 years ago. This was before the internet, right? What we would do is we'd, you know, we'd find out, go to the electoral roll and find out their name. We'd pay to go in country houses, you know, that are open to the public. Excuse me, that I'm just having a little, um, little drop of tea. Right, and that's what we used to do, right? And I know, right, I haven't gone into too much detail about my career and the gear I had, right, because I have to be a bit careful, you know, and the people that I've met and the things I've done, right? I mean, I don't want to put myself in it, do I? Do you know what I mean? You know, when you're talking about all these different people that I've sort of met along the way, um, money launderers, I've got lovely stories about that, right, see? Where I live, right, it's a funny little place. Everyone thinks it's all out of the way and you can go and hide here, right? But the trouble is you get a cluster of people thinking that. Well, anyway, right, so these things are vulnerable all the time. Okay, now in the Netherlands, right, you've got someone who's used a firearm, right, to steal, try and steal a $2 million money, right, and it gets four years. What message does that send? Right, now... We've also got Arthur Brand, right, in the Netherlands, right? He's playing both ends against the middle, right? He's a criminal who's trying to pretend that he's the knight in shining armour recovering stolen art, right? But really what he's doing, right, he's buying back stolen art off of criminals and handlers and he's selling it back to the insurers or the museums. Totally and utterly illegal, even in the Netherlands, right? But he's got contacts in the Dutch art squad, Right, uh, Richard Bronswick, who's doing it now, I've, I, I've said he's either naive or he's corrupt. But Martin Finkelberg, right, he used to be the top Dutch art cop for 40 years. And I can honestly say, right, the man is totally and utterly corrupt, or was. He's retired now, right, so he he's got no burden of office. But Martin was very, very pragmatic, especially back in the 80s, right, when I used to deal with, um, what's his name, John Dillon, right, from Harlem. Right, and Vimy, right, and other Dutch dealers, right, in the, um, um, Newtman, and all of them, right, in the, um, 1980s, right, and Martin Finkelberg was the, uh, Dutch art cop then, right, inherently corrupt, okay, and he retired after 40 years, right, last year, or the year before, in, no, sorry, in 2020, and Richard Bronswick, right, with his floppy locks, right, he likes being photographed and all this, and he likes going to all these exhibitions and that, right, well, he's either naive or he's corrupt. And we've gone into the story about Arthur Brand and the Van Gogh and the uh, Franz Holes, right, that Niles Manara stole, okay? And Hank Beslin was part of the little Dutch art crime cartel where you've got Michel Van Rijn, you've got uh, Niles Manara, okay? You've got Octave Durham, you've got Arthur Brand, you've got Hank Beslin, Okay, right, and there's other people there, right, Rob and Hans Meeson, okay, right, and there's other people that I could name, well, Raphael Imperiali as well, because he used to have the uh, cannabis co cafe, uh, coffee shop in uh, the Netherlands that he was left by, uh, left, he was left it by his brother. You see, in this little Dutch art crime cartel, right, they stole the Van Gogh from the Lauren Museum, they stole the Fra Franz Holes for the third time, right, from uh, Leerdam, 
right? And then they wanted to make a hat trick of it, right? They um, uh, wanted to steal the, the money um, worth $2 million last August, Hank, Hank Beslin, right? But he got caught, right? He dropped the painting when the public stepped in and then he, his face was on CCTV and he's been caught. He's been weighed off today, sentenced four years. Right, and Arthur Brown, right, you know, tries to make himself funny, right, because I said it first, right, um, you know, they got the Van Gogh, they got the Franz Holes, but they didn't get the money, you know, well, like Meatloaf used to say, you know, two out of three ain't bad, what is it, now, don't be sad, Dutch art crime cartel, right, two out of three ain't bad, and then what's coming next, Right, some crazy lunatics, right, with machine guns, I suppose, right, at the Rikes Museum or somewhere like that, and they're going to steal Vermeer. You know, it's not a very good message they're sending. And also in the UK, right, um, there's so many country houses, they're all open now, and for two years, right, no one's been out to go and see them, so they, they're going to get a few people wanting to come in, right? Well, but trust me on this one, right, it's already written. Right, what's going down? And there's a target list, you know. And I'll just like, you know, this uh, constable that's back up in Cambridge here, right, I just think they should up the security on it, right? It's an accident waiting to happen. It'd be like ca taking candy, right, from a baby. It's a big picture. They'll just, they'll just stand the knife out of the picture, out of the frame, right? Because um, once it's stolen, right, it's never going to be out to be sold to anyone. And all it will be able to be used for, right, is underworld currency. Do you remember when we spoke about the Rothschild gold boxes, 106 of them, right? They've recovered 10, well, they've recovered 9, and then that one um, came, uh, was put in an auction last year. So there's 105, uh, sorry, there's 95 Rothschild gold boxes, right, floating around the underworld, right, being used as currency, right, on little drug deals. Okay, look, you old... That, um, that Rothschild gold box, give me a couple of ounces of cocaine, they go off and sell the cocaine, go back, give them the money and get the Rothschild gold box back, right? Use it as collateral, right? And it also, it's another way where cash is not changing hands. And then we move into the drug thing, don't we? See, it's now drugs and art and all this, right? And then obviously the Daniel Kinahan and the Kinahan saga continues, right? And uh, she's got her, uh, um, she was on Sky News, right? One of the... Um, Mothership media organisations in the UK alongside the BBC. They've done a podcast. Now, Nicola's hedging her bets, right? Which I can't understand why, right? But she's dropping in a little hints, right? She obviously can't say what she has been told behind the scenes. But she's saying, right, she's hedging her bets. She's giving herself a nice window. She said, I don't think they'll be arrested in the next um, two weeks. She said, but in six months' time, the Kinahan cartel will look completely different. I mean, talk about sitting on the fence, right, well, and also she dropped him, right, which people probably won't, but I'll listen, every word I'll listen, right, I hang on every word, right, she said also, she said, um, there's an opportunity for the Kinahans, because they, the last thing they want, right, is to go in with the US judicial system, right, because they'll never come out of that, right, if they ever, if they get taken to the US, right, that's the end of them, the rest of their life in jail, Right, and so Nicola um, Talent said, right, well, maybe they'll want to um, hand themselves in or avail themselves to a more friendly or more lenient European judicial system like we've seen today, right? Arm robber goes in. He's got previous, right? So it's not like spur of the moment, Hank Beslin. Hank Beslin, right? He, he stole the Van Goghs in 2002, got weighed off for that. He got four years for that. But there was no guns, right? They just went up and stole them. This time... So he's a repeat offender, same crime, identical, high-value art, $2 million money. He goes there, right, and a gun gets shot and all that carry on. So if you look, just look at it, the rules of law, right, he should have got it the same four years he got in 2002 for the Van Goghs, right, plus he should have got some more, right, for the firearm and shooting the firearm on a Sunday morning where there's all families and kids and the judges decided that he did endanger life. Okay, so now, all of a sudden, we go back to the drugs, right? And, you know, and Daniel Kennehan. And then Nicola Tallent, she dropped it in. They can come to the table and negotiate who they're going to hand themselves in for. Well, I've been saying that for weeks anyway. Right, that's off the script. Right, it's, you know, um, 
This has been telegraphed, right? Never in history, right? Do you ever hear of them? You know, did they say to John Gotti or did they say to any of the other big gangsters, right, we're going to sanction you now? Um, we're not going to, um, 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 we, you know, we're going to freeze all your assets and that. No, they nick them. They arrest them first. Right, they, they've done it the other way round with the Kennehans. They've given them every opportunity, right, to put their nice smart suits on and go with their lawyers down and hang themselves in and maybe to a much friendly... And behind the scenes, right, well, it might come out a bit later that, that, that discussions have been going on behind the scenes through third parties. Okay, so we might see a resolution to the Kinnahan thing, which would be the best thing that could ever happen would be a peaceful resolution where they go and they hang themselves in to um, the judicial system and there's a deal being negotiated where they, they allow themselves to be flown to the Netherlands. You see, it's coming back in again, isn't it? You see, the Netherlands, right, quite lenient, right? Now, Christy Kinnahan, Christopher, and what's his name, um, Daniel, avail themselves to the Netherlands, could get like quite a lenient sentence. But then you've got the Irish, um, uh, the Irish government and the Irish state um, and the Attorney General and that waiting in the background right to press charges there and you've got the Americans lurking in the background. So, you know, um, it, it might look like a slow motion car crash, right? Because it is, that's what it is. Right? Never in history, right, have organised criminals had it telegraphed to them, okay, right, like the Kinnahans have had it done. And I know you can go back and you can say that there's you know, El Chapo and all this kind of carryings on with the, with the Mexicans, right? And he ends up in Supermax. Well, that's the way that this is going. You know, there are obviously negotiations. Well, there are negotiations are being conducted through third parties, right? And the Kinnahans, though, right, they've always got aces up their sleeve, right? You know, I mean, we, we can... We can slate them and we can have a go at Daniel Kinnahan, right? Because he dresses like a fucking idiot, right? Well, he dresses like he's got two bob. Okay, right? You know what I mean? You know, um, driving all them Ferraris and that, right? He should be in a Savile Row suit, okay? Because he's moved up and you move up with it, right? And he shouldn't have gone into the boxing and started bullying Bob Aaron and started being aggressive, right? Because it don't work, right? Because all of it, it's like the schoolyard bully, all of a sudden, everyone keeps their head down and keeps their mouth shut and just becomes sycophants, right? But then when it comes on top, fuck me, everyone piles on, right? Everyone piles in. And what they should do, right, is they should just avail themselves to the legal system. But the thing is, the ace up the sleeve for the Kinnahans is they've got a lot of blackmail material, right? Christy Kinnahan, this ain't the two boys, Christopher and Daniel. Christy Kinnahan's got a lot of blackmail material on a lot of very important people, politicians, and especially in the Middle East, right? And could even be members of certain royal families in the Middle East, right? Blackmail material, right? So same sort of thing he was up to, right? Jeffrey Epstein, right? You know, young girls, young boys, and all that perverted stuff and all that stuff. Okay, and so that's their bargaining chip, right? And, and any deal, right, has got to be that they're not going to produce any of this stuff and embarrass some of the um, top politicians in the Middle East and, and royal families. Okay, right? Because that's the way they operate. You know what I mean? Christy Kinnahan, that is. So they've got lots of stuff that they can throw back. Okay, now the Americans, I mean, they don't give a fuck anyway. I mean, at the end of the day, if it comes out that the... Um, um, the royal families in the Middle East have been um, and doing perverted stuff, right? And then it's all on the internet or something like that. Well, um, it'd be embarrassing for them, right? Well, you just got to ask what's more important. So negotiations are going on, right, through third parties, right? That if these people hand themselves, the Kinnahans are hand themselves in voluntarily, what can they expect, right? Well, can there be a guarantee that the US won't? seek their extradition, right, and indict them and charge them in the US as part of, of any negotiation, okay? And, you know, and I'm no doubt Christy Kinahan, Daniel and Christopher will be trying to negotiate. We, only, we want to face all the music, all charges and everything in the Netherlands. Because in the Netherlands, right, they'll probably, you know, the, the, the maximum sentence they're going to get in the Netherlands would be about 25% of what they would get um, in Ireland, 
right? And in the US, you can just, you know, it's good night, Gracie, good night, Vienna, right? They'll never be seen again, right? They'll be in Supermax. So it's all sort of happening, right? But I like the way Nicola Talent's hedging her bets, right? Because we all thought, right, it's all coming up to the line. Now, things are going on, right? And the thing is, right, is that everyone's playing little games, right? And then just when we all think it's quiet and nothing's going to happen, bang, right? All of a sudden, it'll, you know, it'll hit the news. And I'm still convinced, right, it'll always be looking in the rearview mirror. Right, I might be wrong, but, you know, we all have our opinions, you know, um, and they seem to be sort of like, what they're doing is they're picking off all the low fruit and they're going up the tree, right? And then they're seeing what's happening. Now, this thing with the sanctions, you see, this is a new thing. With the sanctions, right, they've got the sanctions from um, the West and the sanctions now from the UAE, right, and all the computer geek analysts, right, are sitting there because they know every account, crypto and all that about the Kinahans. They're just waiting, right, to see how they've reacted to these sanctions and how they're going to move their money and all their assets and who they're contacting and all that carry on. And, you know, the NSA, right, they've they got their um, eyes and ears on the Kinahans. And so now the sanctions are out, and they're going to, you know, they've given it a couple of weeks to see what they're doing, who they're contacting, where the money's going, where it's coming in from, and all this stuff. And at some point in time, it's, you know, it's going to happen, right, if it hasn't happened already. Okay, well, it's just, it, it's sort of interesting, isn't it, you know, and the way that they sort of bleed into each other, the um, art crime world and the drug world, and the trouble is, right, is is the biggest mistake, right, that will go down in history with the Kinnahans, right, is that they came into town, right, like the Clampets, wasn't it? You know, do you remember them? They found oil, the Clampets. They were, um, um, was it the Clampets? Um, and they found oil on their land and they went to Hollywood, didn't they, right? Well, but they still wore their dungarees. And if there's any lesson in this, is if you get the opportunity to move up into them circles, you blend in. Right, not with bling and stupid diamond watches and Hublot watches, right? What you try and do is you blend in in a more quiet sense, right? And you don't try to step on too many toes and come in like a bull in a china shop, right? People like Bob Arum, right, have been criminals. Yeah, Bob Arum's a criminal. Of course he's a criminal, right? But for decades, right? But they play the game quietly. Bob Arum is as dishonest as any other of the people you talk about in the whole of this, just because he don't handle cocaine, right? He would certainly spend cocaine money and wash it and launder it and threaten people and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's just the way that, you know, it is, but it's done, in a, it's done in a sort of almost, I don't know, not acceptable way. It's done a way where they all have their piece of the pie. Where the Kinahans come in, they want all the pie for themselves. And we've seen that before with, like, Pablo Escobar. And we've seen that before when all of a sudden major criminals, because what happens, right, now psychologists will tell you this, right, is criminals, right, once they become very, very successful, they crave respectability. And so what's happened is, you know, like um, moths to a flame, they then try and make themselves respectable. Okay, well, that's okay if you genuinely have given up the criminal life and you're now legitimate and you don't get involved in crime. You want to present yourself as, yes, yeah, someone with a past, right, but I don't get involved in any of that. Well, Daniel Kenahan, right, was trying to run with the hare and hunt with the hounds, and you can't do the both. And now all the chickens are coming home to roost, right? And all them silly plastic, um, sorry, I'm not going to use that word, right, because he's my mate, isn't he? Um, all them pretend gangsters, right? Ben Davidson, right? Coogan, right? All them, right? They can all wet themselves once they get interviewed by the police, right? And him, right? Tyson Fury, right? All of them, right? And there's another thing as well. There's a photograph on the internet of Tyson Fury standing there, right, with two other Ottos. And on the thing, it said, right, it said, um, stop glorifying rats, you know, what kind of message is that from the heavyweight champion of the world, right? You know what I mean? He thinks he's a gangster. He wants to be a gangster in the morning, right? And he wants to be a family man in the afternoon. Well, my message to Tyson Fury is, listen, if I was you, I'd keep your head down. Don't keep putting out videos, right? And I know what your PR team is saying. Yeah, put a video out, you boxing with the kids in the ring. That's it. And next week, we're going to go and we're going to do this, you know, help him raise money for charity and all that. Well, you know what I mean? But is, that, is that before the storm hits then? Right, because what's coming down the road, right, 
is a different kind of fight than fighting for the heavyweight championship of the world. It's fighting for your liberty. You know, Tyson Fury's got to make the decision, right? Is he going to go into court as a witness or is he going to go into court as one of the accused? Right? And none of them are going to get away with it. All of them. Eddie Hearn, Frank Warren, right? All, all what's been going on, right? Because there's been a long, long time. Okay, right? Ten years, right? Um, there's been, a, a, you know, four, five, six, eight, ten years. Money washing, money laundering, the big bags of money. Right, it's all going to come out now, and it's all going to come on top, right? And not only in boxing, but in snooker. Ronnie O'Sullivan, he won the World Championship again, right? Well, he better start getting a new machine to start washing some money. He's got to pay the piper, right? And Ronnie O'Sullivan, go and look about his background, right? His father, right, was um, um, was in jail, a murder. Okay, right, it was it was um, a West End of London pornographer, and you know all that pornography shit, right? That was Ronnie O'Sullivan's father, right? And I know you can't blame the children for what the parents do, okay? But that's it's, that's the world, right? Then you've got Jimmy White, right? The degenerate gambler, right? Wonderful um, snooker player, right? He washes um, 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 lawn, um, drug money. Then you go into the football, into the soccer. And in soccer, you've got Kenny Dalgleish. You've got, uh, you know, loads of... And then you've got Mike Ashley, the billionaire who owns Sports Direct, Right, having deals with Daniel Kinnahan, MTK, right, and washing, laundering money for da uh, for the Kinnahan cartel. Okay, so this has got a long, long way to run. But they've been building this up over a long, long time. And what's happened now, we're coming to, the, we're coming to a head and they're giving the Kinnahans every opportunity to come in quietly with your lawyers and, and then we'll do battle in court. But what's holding it up, right, it's the negotiations of where they're going to be right, extradited to, and whether the US, right, although they've put sanctions on, okay, it does say in the sanctions, if behaviour changes, well, the US, if the US step back and say, we won't look to in, indict in the United States of America, the Kinnahan cartel, the Kinnahans, right, they might like to take their chances in Europe and maybe, um, you know, Ireland, so it's a double-edged sword, if they were going to come in before, and take their chances, right? Well, now the US is involved, right? But, um, you know what I mean? They're obviously terrified because it's game over. As I say, if they get arrested and whipped off to a military base and flown straight to the United States, right, that's the end of them, right? Like El Chapo, like all the others. So anyway, it'd be interesting to see what's going to happen, right? But as I say again, I like old Nicola Talent. Right? I like the way she hedges her bets. In six months, right? So she's given herself six months. It's like that joke, isn't it, right? Do you remember that joke? Bloke goes to the doctor, and the doctor gives him six months to live, right? He comes back, and sorry, he can't pay his bills, so the doctor gives him another six months, right? You know what I mean? Jokes. Sometimes they're funny, aren't they, right? You know what I mean? You know, um, but it's all coming to a head, and and the world's across him, right? Now, we're moving into the art crime season, right? And I'm... I mean, it's all been quiet on the Western Front, right? And I don't like it when it's all quiet, right? Because it means something is cooking up. There's something being cooked up in the background. Okay? You've only got to Google stolen art. Not many stories recently, just bollock stories, not, you know, fluffy stories. But no big art thefts, right? Well, we're only in May. We've only just started May, right? And they're all dusting down all the country houses across Europe and all the... Um, like museums, right, and then they're looking for, for, for customers, you know, they haven't, they've had two years of the lockdown, right, so they might get a lot of people, now, when you get a lot of people there, right, if you haven't got the right security, right, people are going to see that, and they're going to take advantage of it, right, well, don't say you ain't been warned, anyway, this is Art Hostage, right, episode 83, okay, quick round up, right, the um, um, Hank Beslin, Monet, right, he gets four years, you got a £20 million constable who's gone back on display in Cambridgeshire, right, that the Johnsons can whiz it out the frame, right, it, with um, a very sharp right, um, scalpel or Stanley knife in seconds, and it's surrounded by a couple of million dollars worth of bronzes. It needs to be protected. It's in an alcove, right, so you should put some shutters on it, right, and take the warning. Okay, Art Hostage, episode 83, signing off.